Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session. Hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, I will do my best to keep you awake for the next hour, uh, but I understand how the, the post-lunch uh, doldrums can set in a little bit, so if I see you nodding off, uh, I, I'll understand. Uh, my name's Kevin Pilch. Uh, I'm a group engineering manager at Microsoft. Uh, I've worked at Microsoft for the last 17 and a bit years. Um, and uh, for most of that time, I worked on kind of the C-sharp IDE team, the team that does things like IntelliSense and refactorings and completion and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, for the last six months or so, I've been the group manager for the ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework team. Uh, and so having only been on that team six months or so, I'm not like super familiar with the content there to be able to give a whole hour long talk on my own. Uh, and so I decided to kind of fall back on, on some of my roots, and uh, when I looked through the, the session list for NDC, I didn't really see anything tools oriented, and so I thought it was important to kind of talk about uh, and demonstrate some of the, the advances that have happened in Visual Studio over the last few years. Um, before I get started, can I get a show of hands? How many people use Visual Studio on a regular basis? I assume most of you. Uh, how many people are on 2019 already? Just about everybody, great news, all right. Um, so I'm going to show you some stuff that's new in 2017, some stuff that's new in 2019, some stuff that's been there since 2005, uh, but stuff that I, I find that a lot of people don't, uh, don't always know about. Um, I have, I think, eight more slides after this, but the last time I gave this talk, uh, this was the only one we looked at, because I kind of like to stay in a demo kind of or in demo mode. So I'm going to switch over to Visual Studio, we're gonna spend most of the next hour, maybe the whole next hour uh, inside Visual Studio, playing around with some of the capabilities that are there. Uh, if anybody has any questions during, feel free to shout them out. Uh, I can go off script a little bit um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So definitely feel free to, to shout out some questions. So with that, I'm gonna exit my slideshow and the first thing I'm gonna do is start Visual Studio. So when I click on Visual Studio in 2019, one of the first things that you see is this new getting started screen. And this getting started screen has a couple of things that are interesting about it. So first of all, it comes up pretty quickly. That's a deliberate decision we made. We actually show this screen while the rest of Visual Studio is still loading in the background invisibly. And so while you're thinking about what it is you wanna get going, we're getting ready to do the next thing. And so you can kind of get to what you're doing a little bit faster. One of the other things we found is that people who didn't grow up using Visual Studio, I know some of you in the audience were talking about you know, starting using VB3 and VB4, and maybe you're used to the Visual Studio experience and UI and you know how to get going, but somebody who's relatively new to coding starts Visual Studio, they get this big screen with 200 menus, with 1,000 menu options, and they say, what do I do next? Right? And so we wanted to give people a little bit of a simpler entry point. And so we have this get started column over here that has options like clone or check out code. And I can click on that and just click GitHub. And if I've associated my GitHub account with my Visual Studio account, then it will go and find all of the repositories that I own uh, in my GitHub, all the ones that I have contributed to in the past, um, all the ones that are in organizations that I'm a member of, like all the ASP.NET ones, so I can kind of really quickly get in, and it will go ahead and clone that and open it in Visual Studio so I can get started working. We're not gonna do that one today. Uh, we're actually gonna go back, and this will be fun, because my resolution is too big to see the back button. Uh, so we'll start this again. <laughs> Haven't quite tried with this font setup before. Uh, next thing I wanted to show was kind of the create a new project, so we also revamped the create new project dialog. Uh, so this is now kind of a tag based system and a capability based system. So I can filter to what language I use over here. I can search and there's a bunch of different tags. Uh, if I'm doing cross platform development, I can find all of the templates that work on Android, for example, uh, that are C sharp templates with what I have installed here. And of course, I can see my recently used templates. Again, we're not gonna do this and hopefully, yeah, we're gonna keep start restarting VS. We are instead going to open an existing project that I've already created. And so I'm gonna say, I have it here pinned, so this is a recent list, uh, and you can pin things to it, like most jump lists. Instead, because I wanna show you something in the open solution dialog, 
I'm going to click over here on open a project or solution. I'm going to find that uh, solution and select it. But before I click open, I'm going to point out this checkbox down here, do not load projects. Uh, so this is an option for people who work with giant solutions with hundreds of projects, who find that uh, Visual Studio uses more memory than they want to. A lot of people used to use an extension called Funnel uh, that is no longer being maintained, but one of the things it allows you to do is only load a subset of the, the projects in your solution. And so we sort of embraced that uh, and built it in. So I can now open a solution without any loading any of the projects, and you can see it opens pretty quickly. I'll pin Solution Explorer over here, and the projects are not loaded. Well, that's not a particularly useful way of working, uh, but what I can do is I can right-click right and load some projects. So in this case, I'm gonna load this de dependencies.web project. We'll assume that I don't care about testing very much, so I'll leave the, the unit test project unloaded. Like, I'm, I'm an actual software engineer, so I don't care that much about testing. I just wanna focus on, on getting the code written. So this is good, but it's kind of a pain if I have to do this slow every time I want to start Visual Studio. It'd be really nice, and, and this is also a tr kind of trivial solution with only two projects. In reality, I might have more than that. Figuring out which ones I want to have loaded, what their dependencies are, that can be kind of tricky. And so if I right click on the solution here, uh, down at the bottom of the menu, there's a few new options down here. So there's things like uh, load project dependencies, which says of all the projects that I have loaded so far, Go through and load all of their project to project references so I have kind of all of the dependency tree down. And then I can do something like save as a solution filter. And so I can create a new file that is called a solution F, SLNF, which is a human readable file that contains the lists of projects that I want Visual Studio to load. And the next time I open the solution, Instead of opening the SLN file, I can open the SLNF file and get back to that state of kind of a partial, partial solution that I want to work with. Uh, so that's pretty great for people that work with, with giant solutions. Uh, we're not actually going to do that today. I have a, a pretty trivially small solution. So I'm just going to go down here and say load all projects. And for the rest of it, we'll work with, with all of the projects. So, We've talked, we, so we've got a solution open now. We haven't looked at any code yet, but there's a few more things I want to point out before we do. One is uh, we kind of revamped the UI of Visual Studio a little bit. Some of it's a little bit subtle, but we now uh, custom draw the window title bar. So we no longer have kind of the standard windows title bar there. Most apps do this now. It kind of looks a little bit nicer. It also gives us a few more pixels of real estate, which project, particularly when I'm projecting at a low resolution and large fonts, uh, I kind of really appreciate. So you can see the menus are kind of right here along the top row. Uh, over here, this is the name of the solution. Most of the time you can see the whole name of the solution because the, the fonts aren't quite as big as this. Uh, and we've done a bunch of work in the search bar. So if I click Control Q, I can now search my code, I can search settings, I can search menu bars, I can kind of find all the things that I might do in Visual Studio directly by clicking into the search box that's in the title bar uh, or entering it with Control Q. Along with kind of the, the most of you, have, you are using 2019, have been using 2017, so you're familiar with the new installer that we have uh, that allows you to have side-by-side -side installs. So you can have a preview install, you can have a regular install, you can have an enterprise install and a community install, uh, you can have multiple versions of Visual Studio kind of side by side with each other. And that's kind of what this thing over here says. So right now I have a, a build that's called the int preview. Uh, so this is the internal preview uh, that we get inside uh, Microsoft. And basically what happens is every time we produce a build of Visual Studio that passes our CI CD workflow, we promote it to this channel and it shows up as an, up as an update to all of our internal engineers the same way that you see updates in Visual Studio. And mo the way that most people in the division work is they come in in the morning and they update to last night's build of Visual Studio, and that's what they use to build Visual Studio for today. Um, so this is just kind of lets you know if you have a bunch of those different builds installed, which one you have installed. Last thing before we look at some code, uh, this live share button here, how many people know about live share or have tried it before? A few. Um, so live share is something that we previewed for a while. Uh, in VS 2019, it's now built in. And live share allows you to do 
simultaneous co-editing of your code. So you can start a live share session, send a link to somebody, they can join with their Visual Studio, and they can co-edit the code with you, they can co-debug, they don't have to do any kind of work to set up an environment, and uh, they have read-write access, they have a shared terminal, you can connect to VS Code and from VS Code, and so kind of both people get to use their environment set up the way that they want to. I had heard one kind of really compelling story where this was interesting because there was a, a user who had vision problems. And so they had a really hard time collaborating with other people on their, on their team because when they went to the other person's computer and tried to, to investigate a problem with them, they couldn't see anything on the, the other person's computer. And conversely, when somebody else came to their computer and looked at it, they couldn't understand what was going on with screen readers going and with like highly accessible fonts and that sort of thing. But one of the great things about LiveShare is that each person gets to retain their own IDE customizations. They get to work the way that they want to work uh, while still collaborating on a problem. So it's a, it's a pretty great tool. It's now kind of included in, in VS. So if you work with other people, particularly distributed, but not, not even always distributed, I'd encourage you to give LiveShare a try. All right, let's look at some code for a little bit. So the first thing I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna hide Solution Explorer for a little bit so we have some more real estate and this output window. Uh, I'm gonna control T and I am going to look for a method called get GitHub info. Uh, so control T, uh, also, it can be invoked through control comma. This is kind of go to all, go to everything. So this indexes uh, all of your types, all of your methods, all of your fields, all of your files, kind of everything in your solution, and lets you really quickly get to it with this kind of preview experience. So as I click through, I can see different parts of the code, and I can just go ahead and click enter, and I'm there. So this is the way that I get around my code base most of the time. I don't actually spend a lot of time in Solution Explorer. Uh, because the kind of fuzzy matching search that works in, in go to all is a faster way for me to get around. I just type a few characters of, of what I think the method name might be, and I tend to find it. So we're in this method now, and things look a little different than they might have looked in the past. Uh, I'm gonna magnify even more so that people can see this a little bit, uh, but we have a bunch more colors going on than we had in the past. So you can see uh, oh boy, how do I do this with magnifier? Uh, you can see method names are in kind of a brown, uh, control flow keywords are in kind of a purple, fields and parameters are in kind of a navy blue, types are still in our classic teal that we started doing in 2005, um, but we kind of are trying to give you more ambient information about what's going on in your code without having to kind of hover over something or go to definition or look at it. A uh, couple other points you can see, uh, get GitHub info in the method, is null or empty, and underscore repo parser. Uh, those are all bold. Why are those bold? Uh, well, those are bold because they are static. Uh, so all statics, you can kind of tell at a glance, are bold. So this is a new color scheme that we're trying out for C Sharp. Um, you can customize what all of these customs, what all of these colors are uh, in tools options. If you don't like the choices that we've made, uh, you can set them up the way that you want to. But we want to kind of make it easier, like I said, to, to see at a glance, uh, to provide ambient information about what's going on in your code. I want to look at this kind of repo parser thing next. And so I'm actually going to hit F12 to go to definition on that. And we're going to come over here and repo parser is a regular expression. And the next thing I want to look at is the code of this regular expression. So this is a, a regular expression. I have a compiler background, so I tend to hate regular expressions. I'd personally rather write a parser than use a regular expression. But I understand that some people use regular expressions for things. And one of the things I hear is that they can be pretty tough to write and to remember what all the syntax is and to figure out what I've done wrong. So if you look at this regular expression, it's no longer just a brown string. There's now a bunch of different colors in it. That's because Visual Studio, the language service, now uh, recognizes methods on regex and match and a few of those other classes and knows that those arguments need to be regular expressions. And it has its own regular expression parser that it then uses to classify, to, to color the regular expression contents the way that you want them to be. Um, and beyond that, 
if I type one of these, you can now see we pop up regular expression specific IntelliSense that tells you what this part of the regular expression does uh, and gives you kind of, if I, if I hover over one of these, oh, let's, uh, let's stop zooming for a second. Uh, if, I, if I hover over one of these, I get a whole big description of what this part of a regular expression does, what a, the, this sub-expression is, grouping constructs, uh, and the same thing happens in other parts, right? So if I'm looking at character classes, I get the same thing and all the help about what I can do with character groups and ranges and negative groups and, and all of that sort of thing. So a uh, little help for people who are doing regular expressions. We're looking at adding a few more of these kind of sub-languages that appear in strings periodically. Um, and there's also kind of a comment-based way that you can have a string variable instead of having it go directly to the method. You can put a comment on the line before and say, hey, the string on the next line is actually a regular expression, so treat it like a regular expression. Okay, that's regular expressions. Um, next thing I wanna add, uh, I wanna talk about is a new feature in completion, right? IntelliSense, it's kind of Visual Studio's bread and butter. People have been using it for a long time. It's one of the things that we're most famous for. And so we don't, we, we try not to stand still and kind of rest on our laurels there. We're always trying to improve it a little bit. And so one of the things that we did in uh, VS 2019, uh, I think it was actually in one of the updates, but I forget which one, is we now index types uh, that you don't have usings for. So I'm gonna type service collection here, and you can see to the right of the screen, it has kind of what namespace that, that type comes from, and that is happening because I don't have a using for that yet. But if I go ahead and commit this in IntelliSense, you can see that it goes teal immediately, and we actually added the using for you. So you can just kind of type things, whether you have usings or not. You know, we previously had the add using light bulb that if you remembered exactly how to spell something, you could add the using. Now we kind of go ahead and put those straight into IntelliSense right away and do handle the usings for you. Uh, keeping an eye on my notes so I don't, I don't forget stuff. Um, so uh, going back to control T, uh, one of the features that we added for .NET Core projects is that when I use control T, uh, I can now find uh, csproj files. So let's look for like web.csproj. So csproj files now show up in go to all. Uh, similarly, they preview just like any other files do. So I can hit enter and I'm here in this file. Uh, for .NET Core and .NET Standard projects, we basically treat csproj files like any other project in your solution, the way you expect them to be. And so I can do things like find in files and when I find in files, I can see results that came from csproj files, which is pretty nice. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what's going wrong with your project file, if you're looking for package references and you don't know which, where they are, which project has them, which ones don't, uh, they all kind of show up in the find results now. You can also see that the find in files uh, results looks a lot different than it used to. It used to be kind of a plain flat text window. Uh, now we've reused the same control that it backs the error list and the find references results. And so you have kind of a rich tree view uh, where you can group things, uh, you can lock the results. So if I think I wanna come back to this set of find reference or find in files results, I can lock this and then the next time I invoke uh, find in files, it'll just pop up another instance of that tool window. And so I can just kind of keep my, my historical searches around. Uh, I can type some, something in here to filter within those results. So if I know something about one of the results that I'm looking for, I can filter through those. And of course I can navigate through them with the go to next and go to previous. And I, just like in the error list, I can filter to all files, all the open documents, or my current documents. Uh, so that kind of helps with find and files. Uh, one of the other things that's hard to show in a solution like this uh, there's also been a lot of performance work done in find and files so that we kind of pre-index some of the text so that find and files results should get you, you should be able to get them a lot faster than you had before. I was speaking before about uh, find results or find references and so one of the things that's interesting about find references is that now, uh, what am I looking for? Uh, down here, 
Now, if I find references for something, one of the things that I frequently do when I find references is I F8 through all of the references, look, trying to find how something got a particular value. And so I'm looking for all the places where this thing is assigned to. And it's kind of a pain because I spend a bunch of time hitting F8 and looking at each one and saying, no, that's just the use of it. And so one of the things we added is this kind field over here, kind column. And like everything in the Solution Explorer, you can kind of filter to the unique results in that. So I click this little filter thing. I can uncheck check read. And I can see the one and only place where this particular property gets assigned is right here in this location. And so if I'm trying to find out where to set a breakpoint to find out how a particular value got into something, I can do it very easily to find this. So that's kind of getting around your code, finding, looking at it. Uh, let's take a look at, at changing your code a little bit. A little bit. And so uh, I was kind of joking to, to one of my teammates earlier, uh, this is the part of my session where I just hit control dot a bunch of times and we see what all the, the IDE can do for you. Uh, so we're gonna come back up and talk and look at the top of this file. And so if you look at my solution explorer, I'm in a project called dependencyflow.web, uh, but I'm in a namespace here called dependencyflow.pages. And that's because I renamed my project after I created it. It would originally didn't have the .web on it because I originally didn't even bother creating a test project. When I decided to create a test project, I added .tests and .web. Well, uh, I like to have my namespaces match the, the project names and the folders that I'm in. And so if I click on this class name now, you can see this little screwdriver over here in the margin. Uh, that says Visual Studio has something it can do to help you out. Right, so we have two different icons in there. We have a, a light bulb icon that says, we think you should change something. This is a suggestion. Or we have a tool bot, we have a, a screwdriver, which is a tool. Visual Studio has some tools that can help you change your code if you want to. So in this case, uh, I can hover over that and click on it, or um, I can hit control dot, which has been our way to invoke smart tags and, and light bulbs for a long time. Or if you, uh, if you have some muscle memory for, from some other productivity tools, uh, we also work with Alt-Enter now. So you can just hit Alt-Enter. Uh, and so one of the options here is I can uh, change the namespace. Uh, so I can move two different namespaces, but I should also be able to change the namespace to dependencyflow.web, but I don't see that today. So it could be on, yeah. Uh, yes, sorry, thank you. Help from the audience. Uh, I was, I was alt-entering in the wrong place. So if I click on the namespace itself uh, and hit control dot, it tells me, hey, do you wanna change this namespace to be the one that matches your project and folder structure here? And so uh, in this case, I'm not gonna do it because it, it takes a while, but this is kind of one of the nice things, just a, a little piece of comfort that you can have. Uh, coming back, one of the, our most frequently asked for features is around link. And so what we find is that a lot of people, uh, they like to check in code that uses link because it makes them look smart to all the people that they work with. Uh, but when they're actually working with their code, uh, when they're debugging something, they find that it's pretty hard to, to kind of understand what's going on. And so they like to have for each is where they can set breakpoints and kind of step through. And so one of the features that we've built is the make me look smart feature. So I can come over here to this for each loop and I can hit control dot and I can say convert this to link. And so this has now changed it from a for each loop into a query that has a from, a let clause. You probably didn't even know you could write a let clause, right? Uh, but you can and Visual Studio will help you do it. If you change your mind and say, you know I actually wanna debug this, uh, then I can control dot, I can select it, control dot, and I have to be, it's a little finicky. Uh, you have to be inside these parentheses, but I can control dot and I can say, no, actually convert that back to a for each, right? So I can go back and forth the two different ways. I can see which one is easier to understand what's going on. Uh, for now, I'm gonna stick with this one because I wanna show a couple of other things. Uh, here, I have this explaining variable. I have a, a little temporary variable that it kind of helps. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna play around with the code. One of the things that I spend a lot of time doing, 
and that I really appreciate that Visual Studio helps me with is spending time figuring out what the code looks like the best. So I can type in code however I want to kind of get it working as fast as I want, and then I can spend some time playing with it before I send it out for code review to say, well, how do I want this code to live forever? Everybody remembers that you should assume that the person that maintains your code knows where you live and it's gonna come find you, right? So you wanna make sure you do a good job having code that, that is easy to understand. And so one of the best ways I find to do that is to just play with it and look at it in different forms. So let's do that a little bit here. So I can come to this variable and say, well, what would it look like if I didn't have this variable? What if I inlined this in the places where it was used? Well, okay, maybe that looks a little bit simpler. Let's keep going with this. What if I control dot again? Well, I have two consecutive if statements. What does it look like if I put both of them together? Okay, this might be getting a little bit complicated. I did a CS degree. There was like logic stuff about ors. I've got an or in here and a less than and stuff. There was something, De Morgan's Law, I think it was called, about like changing ands to ors. I don't really remember what it looks like. Uh, but if I come over here to this and and hit control dot, then Visual Studio, we don't call it De Morgan's Law, we just say replace and with or. Uh, but we apply something called De Morgan's Law and change this into an or statement. And I can look at it and say, well, that looks horrible. I definitely don't want to check it in that way. So let me control dot and we'll go back to the and. So here I am in an and. Uh, I got rid of the, uh, the variable. I went to kind of a, a combined thing. Uh, let's see, let's look at this again. Uh, one of the options I didn't choose before is the convert to link with call form. I didn't do that because we had to introduce that, that uh, temporary variable, and so there's not really a good call form that you can do there. But now that we don't have that temporary variable, I can do this, and so this does uh, the same operation, but it does it to kind of the link methods that you're used to. So it converts it into a where and a select, uh, and th so this is another way of looking at the code. And so we've seen like five or six different ways of how this code could work. They all execute the same way. They might have slightly different performance characteristics, whether they allocate and capture things or not. Uh, but they all kind of return the same results. And so you get to kind of very easily look at all the different ways your code could be structured and decide which one works best for you. There was a, a computer science tooling researcher that I worked with, and I'm drawing a blank at his name right now, but he used to talk about the idea of refactoring your code and, and kind of refactorings falling into a diff couple of different categories. And so he would say some refactorings are like flossing your teeth, right? There's something that you do all the time, they're pretty quick, they're pretty easy, uh, but if you don't do them, then things go poorly and you have to do root canal refactorings, right? And so one of the things that Visual Studio has tried to do has built in a bunch of floss type refactoring. So I can quickly change things around and look at it and see how I want my code to look, how I think it's most maintainable. I definitely don't think this is the most maintainable. So I'm gonna fall back to my favorite undo. Uh, and I'm gonna go back to kind of where we started because I think this is a pretty easy to understand, pretty debuggable set of code for this. Yes. Mm-hmm. Standard, but yeah. <laughs> so, so the question is like, well, uh, you know, this is, this is nice tooling, but uh, a lot of teams kind of have pre, uh, prescribed formats and they say this is the way that you should do things, right? And I, I, I think that's true. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. I think that a lot of times there's nuance in what's the best choice, and I think having the ability to quickly change between things and see what they look like allows you to have a richer discussion about which is the right thing for this time, right? If, if it was like, oh, I'm gonna go spend some time rewriting this code to be the different way, and then we can talk about it, and if we decide that we still want it the first way, then I have to throw that out, and it's kind of wasted time then you're much less likely to have that conversation than if you can hit control dot and say, well, what about this way? And then you can say, well, well why do you prefer the other way? And then, so you can kind of have a, a little bit of a richer conversation when the actual effort of changing the code doesn't get in the way. 
All right, let's see where I am over here. Um, oh, so we played a bunch with if statements. Uh, I wanted to show that we did the same thing for everyone's favorite uh, conditional operators, also known as ternary operators. Uh, so I can come over here to a ternary operator, conditional operator, I hit, can hit control dot, and I can invert that and say, well, what if it went the other way around, right? So it's a similar sort of thing where I can just try it, see which way, I prefer it, I don't have to think about you know, where's the question mark, where's the colon, all those things, even when I have crazy code that has nested conditionals inside of other conditionals. Um, the Visual Studio kind of has a parser, it knows what the precedence is, it knows how to do that. Uh, another thing that I spend far too much time doing uh, is playing with argument lists. Uh, so I have an argument list over here, it's a pretty long one, you know, if people are working with Solution Explorer pins, then they can't see what's in this. And so wouldn't it be nice if I had a way of changing this, right? So Visual Studio now has a bunch of controlled odd options that says, well, like, what if we wrapped all those to the next line? Or uh, what if we wrapped each one and aligned them with the first one, right? Uh, this is my least favorite style. Um, so what if I instead said indent every parameter. So just start every one indented by four, right? So again, I can kind of try all of these things, or if my team has a prescribed style for which way it does it, then I can just find that option and apply it and uh, kind of quickly get to this point, and I don't have to spend a bunch of time rearranging parameter lists, which I, I don't know about other people, but I find that I spend far too much time doing that. Uh, so next thing I wanna look at is this, uh, this count equals zero line down here. So I'm gonna zoom in again. Uh, this count equals zero line, you can see it's kind of gray. Um, it's not actually gray, it's black, uh, but it's got a transparency overlay on it. And the reason it's got a transparency overlay on it is because that doesn't do anything. We're assigning zero to this, this variable, uh, but nothing reads from it after that. And so Visual Studio is kind of telling us there's no point in doing this assignment. So you uh, can hopefully see four magenta dots underneath count uh, and a, a light bulb in the margin. The four magenta dots are Visual Studio saying, I have a suggestion for you. I have something that you might wanna do. I think it's the right thing to do. So it's not a tool, it's not a, something you could do if you want to, it's I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, my dots are magenta because I changed the color in tools options. By default, uh, people thought magenta was too noisy, and so they're kind of a muted gray dot underneath something for a suggestion. Uh, but I like to see what Visual Studio is, tr is trying to suggest to me, and so I make mine magenta. So if I hover over this, or I click on, uh, if I hover over this, there we go, uh, or I click on that, uh, I get an a error message kind of in this parameter, or in this quick info that says unnecessary assignment, and it says I can hit Alt-Enter to, to see what I can do about it. Well, one of the things I can do is remove the redundant assignment. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the redundant assignment. Visual Studio can delete some code for me. That's not a particularly difficult thing to do, but it just saves me a second while I'm looking at it kind of within Visual Studio. Zooming back out, if I click on count here, uh, highlight references kicks in and shows me th those two places where count is used. Uh, if I use control shift up down, I can kind of navigate between those places where, uh, where a variable is used. And so I don't know how many people have seen that before, but when something is highlighted because the cursor's on it, control shift up and down allows you to navigate to it. So I was gonna do that with count, and so I quickly determine that these are the only two places where count exists. So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna bother logging the value of count. It doesn't look like we use it for anything. So I'm just gonna delete that. And now I get a suggestion up here uh, that says count is not used anywhere in this method. Why don't you go ahead and remove it as long as it's not part of the public API? Uh, and that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. So if I hit control dot, I can change the signature of this method find count and say, let's remove that guy. And this will go find all the places where that method is called, remove the expression that called it. Yes, you have to be careful if those expressions had side effects that your program depended on, you just lost those side effects. 
So you might want to look at uh, source control and, and verify that this is the change that you want to make. Uh, but Visual Studio will help you make it. So there we go. Uh, we've done kind of a bunch of things, cleaning up code a little bit. Uh, next thing, did I delete two things? I did. There we go. Um, next thing to kind of show a small quality of life improvement. Uh, we've had a refactoring called Extract Interface since 2005. Uh, you can get to it with Control R, Control I, or you can get to it with Control Dot on the type of a, a method or a, a, a type. Uh, and it kind of gives you this dialog that lets you generate a new file with a new interface in it. Uh, we added an option to just add it to the current file. A lot of people who are doing something like TDD, they might be building stuff up. They might want to build a whole bunch of stuff up in a single file uh, and then decide on names and then kind of explode it out into a set of files later on. And so while they're in the flow of just generating a bunch of stuff, they want it to all stay in the same file. So now you can do that. Uh, I s unselected everything. Let's go ahead and pick a uh, rate limit. And I've generated a new interface uh, that has that method in it. And I updated my class to, to implement that interface. It's not particularly exciting. And one of the pieces of feedback that we heard a lot was, that's great if I think of everything up at all at once. But what if I just want to change that interface? Well. Uh, one of the features that we recently added is this idea that when I have a member, if I hit control dot, I might want to just pull that up and add it to the interface. So I can just hit pull up, and that will generate uh, an instant or generate that method in the interface that I have. Or if I want to be a little bit more uh, more root canalish, if I want to do something a little bit bigger, I can control dot. And I can pull, pick this option to, with a dot, dot, dot that's going to give me a dialog. And so this gives me a list of everything that I might want to move up to the base type. This works whether the base type is an, in, uh, an interface or an abstract class. If you have multiple ones, you can pick which one you're going to move it up to. Uh, it has buttons like select all my public members and move them all up. Uh, if you're doing that to an abstract class, that may not work because they may refer to private methods that are in this class. And so like once I sl click select public, uh, then I can click select dependents. And Visual Studio will look at all of the methods that I have selected, and it will find all the other methods that they call, and it'll pick that set of things and kind of move it all up to a base type. So this allows you to kind of rearrange your inheritance hierarchy a little bit uh, when, when you need to do that. Um, Again, this is a little bit more of a kind of invasive thing. It requires a little bit more thinking. It's a little bit more of one of those root canal refactorings, not quite as much of a floss. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip doing that one for now. But let's assume that now I'm done with this interface. I've got it in a form that I'm happy with. Uh, now I do want to move it to another file. Well, I can just go ahead and say, move it to a different file and pick a name for me. And it does that. I can use F12 to to get there once I set focus. Uh, so I can just pop over there and see the interface where it is. Uh, similarly, like one of the things that happens is maybe the reason I wanted this interface is because I wanted to move it to kind of a different layer in my architecture. And so maybe I don't want this to be in the, the pages namespace anymore. Well, then you can kind of click here or control dot here, alt enter, and move to a different namespace. And I get a, a list of all of the different namespaces that exist in my project. And I can just kind of go ahead and move it to whatever namespace I want it to be in. And a couple more to show here in this kind of vein of, of alt enter type things. Um, let's assume that I'm in my startup.cs and I am using endpoint routing, which is this great thing. Uh, that, that Ryan added and, and James worked on in, in ASP.NET Core. And let's assume that I want to add health check support as well. Well, adding health checks means I need to do another thing with this endpoints option. And so I can kind of try to remember how to turn this into a block. I can type an open curly and find the end and type semicolons in the right place. Uh, or 
I can just hit control dot on this and say, use a block body for that instead. Or if I have this and I don't want it, I can control dot and I can say, no, you know what, use an expression body, right? So again, I can kind of go back and forth between the two. So if I have a, if I want to have a block body and I want to like hook up health checks or something, uh, then I can say, uh, map health checks to the health URL, right? And so I can kind of quickly switch forms between different things, not have to remember exactly where all those braces and, and semicolons and all of those things go. Uh, last control dot thing I want to show you, I'm going to pop over here to uh, one of the unit test files we have, and I'm going to write a new unit test. So let's have a fact, public void logging. Um, and we're going to use mock for this. So I'm going to have a mock of an iLogger of an incoming model equals a new oh, uh, logger. Uh, so this is great, except that I have these errors because mock isn't found. Uh, and that's because if I come up here and look at the dependencies node, and I look at the list of packages that I referenced, I'm not actually referencing the mock package. And so at this point, you know, I could come in here and right click and say manage NuGet packages, uh, but I don't actually have to. I can click on this, I can control dot, and I can just say install package mock. Uh, and I'll just say find and install the latest version. And so Visual Studio is searching NuGet, hopefully my Wi-Fi works well here. Um, it added a using mock, um, and everything resolved now, those errors go away. How did it do this? How, like, what, is, what does NuGet do? Or, or what does Visual Studio do here? Uh, we actually uh, have a service that trolls through every package on NuGet, not every package. We troll through like the top thousand most downloaded packages, uh, and we find all the types that exist in those packages, and we build an index of all of those type names, and we ship it down to Visual Studio. And so Visual Studio looks at that index of all the types in the top thousand packages and says, I know what package that's in, I can add a package reference for you. And so that's actually exactly what it did. If I double click on this, uh, CS proj file editing, just like every other file, I can double click on a CS proj file and have it open in the editor. Uh, some people love that. That was like one of our most loved features of VS 2016. Uh, it was also one of our most hated features in 2016. A lot of people strongly believe that double clicking should collapse or expand uh, their, their project files. Uh, so there is an option in tools options if you're one of the people that believes that it should, uh, should expand and collapse instead of open. Uh, I, I believe in opening. Uh, but so Visual Studio went here and it added this package reference to mock for us. So now we're able to kind of use things. All right, I am a little bit behind time. So let's see how quickly we can go. Um, coming over here, let's finish writing this method. Uh, if I use a kind of standard not null method. One of the things you can see here is there is a star beside not null. Why is there a star beside not null? The reason is that uh, Visual Studio is using a machine learning model to predict what are the most likely things that you're going to want to use uh, in IntelliSense. The way that this works is we uh, find I think it's 5,000 projects on GitHub that have 100 stars or more, and we train a machine learning model that says these are the most used members of every type that we can find. Uh, in C Sharp, we do it for TypeScript and Python and C++ and XAML and I think, oh, and Visual Basic, and I think that's all the languages that we support right now. Some of those are still in preview because we're still tweaking the model data a little bit, uh, but you can kind of get this this machine learning guidance. Um, it's also pretty smart. Uh, so if I come in here and say logger, um, if I play with a string, so let's just say string s equals something, right? And I wanna say s equals s dot. Well, it finds the things that I, I commonly do with a string in this kind of context, right? I might trim it, I might too lower it, I might too lower invariance, I might take a substring. It also says length, which doesn't make much sense, but sometimes machine learning is a little bit wonky, right? Sometimes machines aren't actually that smart. Uh, but if I play with a different context, 
So if instead of doing an assignment like this, if I said if s dot, well then I get an entirely different set of things that are starred because the machine learning model takes the context. It says I'm actually, I actually need a Boolean. I am doing this in the context of an if statement. What are the most used members of string in the context of an if statement? Well, it's a different set than it is in an assignment. And so we get a kind of different result. So this is kind of some of our first forays into, uh, into using machine learning to help you code more product productively. Uh, as I said, we have kind of a bunch of things that are in preview there. So if I come into tools options, that feature is called IntelliCode. Should mention the brand name. Uh, IntelliCode is kind of the brand for that. Uh, and so we have a bunch of things that we're playing with, a bunch of features. So one of them is, uh, is this idea of custom models. So as well as having a model trained on, on GitHub, if you have a large enterprise code base of your own with a lot of your own types, you can say, hey, go ahead and train an, an addition to that model for my specific code. And I will point out that when you do this, uh, none of this code, this machine learning code, none of this goes to a service and sends your code to a service. It all runs locally on your machine. There's not a privacy concern where if you train a model, like we're gonna upload all your code to Azure and keep it. Uh, we train the model locally on your machine. It's only for, for you to kind of use. Um, but anyway, there's a bunch of different, different uh, preview things we can do here. One of the ones that I have enabled is this idea of editor config inference. And so let's take a look at what that is. Editor config is a, a kind of convention that started in a bunch of, of uh, open source projects where I can check a file into the root of my repo uh, that has some conventions. And so it started, editor config defines six things. It says like, do I use tabs or spaces? Do I have uh, new lines at the end of, my, at the last line of my file or not? Uh, things like that, how wide is a tab? Um, but they also said, different editors or different languages, you should extend this file. You should put some more stuff in this file that makes sense for your language. And so Visual Studio kind of went whole hog uh, on that. And so uh, combining kind of editor config with that IntelliCode thing, if I right click on a solution and I say add, uh, there's an option here that says new editor config based on IntelliCode. And so if I click that, it's gonna take a little while. What it is doing is it is analyzing all of the code in my solution and saying, what style does this code use? Does it use var or not? Does it use this dot or not? Does it use spaces after colons in names or not, right? Like what are all the formatting options? What are all the code style options that this uses? Let me generate a file that codifies that so I can add it to my repo and I can transfer it along with my source code to other people who use tools that are aware of this editor config file. And then I can solve some of those arguments that you might have with your team about what is the style because Visual Studio can go ahead and tell me what the style is. So let's look for one particular one. Uh, let's look at the options around var, right? So the, uh, the machine learning model has decided that for two of the three options that Visual Studio supports for var, I like to use var. The third option doesn't show up, maybe because this code base isn't big enough for it to form an opinion on that, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add that one manually from memory. Uh, there are other ways to find these, um, but I happen to have worked on this feature and I know this one. Uh, so I'm gonna add the third one. And I'm gonna come back over here to incoming tests and you'll see, oh I forgot to mention with the magenta uh, suggestions earlier, they also show up in this kind of enhanced scroll bar over here. So you can see now I have three suggestions for three places where I explicitly refer to a type, but my editor config has said, no, 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 the style in this code base is to use var. I'm not gonna debate whether var or not var is better. I think it's a personal choice. Uh, I think you're wrong if you don't choose to use var, but it's still a personal choice. Um, so I've got this editor config set up. It's great, everyone on the team can use it. I can come along now and I can hit control dot and I can simplify it, great. What if this is a big code base? What if this is file is more than 40 lines long and there's a lot of places where I use var? Well, one of the things I can do, I'm gonna get rid of this line uh, and I'm gonna, whew, 
Uh, and I'm going to, that's fine. Uh, so I've got two of these places now. I'm going to come back over here to the editor config, and I'm actually going to change these and say, make these a warning, if I can type warning, instead of a suggestion. And so I'll do that for all three of those. And I'll come back over here to this file. And uh, so you'll now see these are screen squiggles instead of suggestions, because Visual Studio understands that editor config file. In fact, the compiler now understands it. And if you add the right NuGet packages to enforce some of these style things, the compiler can generate errors or warnings on your build on your CI uh, if you use the wrong style. Some people care very much about enforcing their style and want to do that. Some people prefer to let it be a suggestion in the IDE. I'm normally a kind of suggestion in the IDE person. But looking at these warnings, one of the other things I wanted to show is this little marker down here. So this is kind of a file health indicator. And so it says I have zero errors in this file. Uh, I have two warnings. I can click on that, and it'll take me to the error list and see what they are. Uh, but we don't have a lot of screen real estate. And I'd like to get rid of the error list now. Please go away, error list. Uh, um, so one of the other things I can do is I can just hit this arrow to say, go to the next one. Right? So I can navigate between the warnings or errors in my file very easily. Uh, and then I have this little paintbrush thing over here. It gives me an option to run code cleanup. And so uh, I'm going to come up here to the top of the file. I'm going to click that. And people who are observant, they notice that it didn't fix my warnings. Uh, but they notice that a using disappeared up here. Well, what's going on? Well, if I click this little arrow, da er arrow down here, I have the option to configure code cleanup. And if I look at it, the default code cleanup profile is set to do nothing but remove and sort usings. That's fine. But we have the option of a second profile. The reason we do this uh, is you there might be something that you want to do a 1,000 times a day, and you want it to be super quick, and you want to be able to trust it. Right? And so that's what we think of as the profile one version. There might be something that you do occasionally when you want to clean up your code. Right? And so I've set this one up to apply fixes for a bunch of different style things. And so if I come out of here, and instead of saying run, just run code cleanup, if I say run profile two, then it fixes all of those things in this file, and I get a little green check mark down here that says I have no issues found in my file. That's great, but what if the solution that I work on has 6,000 files? Do I have to go to every one and say run code cleanup? Uh, well, no. So on the solution and project nodes, uh, we added in this analyze and code cleanup menu the option to run code cleanup on the whole solution, or if you right-click on a project, it'll run it on the project. Great. What if I'm a command line person? Well, here's the one command line part of my demo. Uh, I can come over here, and I can use .NET Global Tools. So I can say .NET Tool install-g.net-format. And again, if NuGet is working well, and well, if, if Wi-Fi is working well enough to get to NuGet, uh, I'll install a global tool. And then I can just come here and say .NET format. So this is now going to load the solution. It's going to run formatting on all the files in my solution. And it changed a couple of things. So one of the things it changed is index.cshtml.cs. Well, let's come back over to Visual Studio and find out what it did. So if I find index.cshtml.cs, and I right click on it, and I say compare with unmodified, uh, somebody didn't have an if, uh, a space after their if statement. Um, and so the .NET format tool found that and fixed it. Uh, just one thing I wanted to call out while I'm here in the diff view, it's sort of unrelated, uh, but it is the idea that this diff view is actually live. I can go ahead and change the code here. So let's say I wanted to change this to be called repository. Uh, this is kind of a live diff view that edits as I go. If I undo that typing, the green and red go away, and it goes back to being an unmodified line. So this is one, something that I like to, to use sometimes, just to kind of keep an eye on what have I actually changed in this file. OK, before we went into all the editor config stuff, uh, we were looking at tests. So let's look at tests a little bit more. The last thing I wanted to talk about is some changes to Test Explorer. Uh, so let's bring up Test Explorer. 
and pin it, because we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at it. So first thing you notice, Test Explorer uh, is horizontal across the bottom of my screen. So we did a bunch of work to relay out how Test Explorer works so that it can work well with a horizontal layout. Um, we also took advantage of that same control that we have in the error list and find results and find references results and a few other places uh, to populate the error list. And so I get the same kind of columns with different filters available to them. I get the same automatic search. Uh, I get the same great scalability up to hundreds of thousands of tests. Um, and so I can, I can use Test Explorer in all of those. I get a nice kind of hierarchical view of where I have tests. Um, and one of the other things you'll notice is that I already have results here for tests, but I haven't opened Test Result, Test Explorer yet. One of the reasons for that is uh, it actually stores the last test result in your .vs folder. So when you load a solution again, it can tell you what the test results were the last time it ran them. So these are kind of stale test results from before we ran. Um, but I can go ahead and run the tests. Uh, one of the things that I'll point out is execution and discovery of tests uh, both now happen outside of the Visual Studio process. The discovery used to happen inside VS, which meant that it had to kind of be fairly serial. It was pretty slow. It used a lot of memory. It could push the VS memory up close to the limits if you had a large solution. Uh, but now it doesn't. Uh, it runs out of process. I'm actually going to run that again because I missed my chance to talk about something that I wanted to talk about. Um, we also have this great set of icons, right? So, so some are failed, some are waiting to run, some are still in process. They're actually executing, so that's what the, the little spinnies are. So there's good vi visualization about what's going on during your test run. So I have a test that failed. If I come over here and click on it, uh, you can see the new test uh, the, the results details pane over here. And one of the things that we've done there is it's no longer just a dump of text. Uh, so there's some icons there. There's links to stack traces that actually navigate. Uh, my personal favorite feature is that the output from your test uh, now happens in a fixed width font. So if you use something like XUnit that has nice visualizations of string differences and points to exactly where something is different, uh, that actually works now, whereas it didn't before. And so I can quickly go ahead and click on this and fix my test. Uh, so I click, uh, I do that. I have a couple more buttons down here. So I can quickly just say rerun just the failed tests instead of rerunning everything. And when I do that, I get some indication of what's going on because these tests are now green. These ones are faded. That says the last time these were run, they passed but you've made code changes since you ran them. There's been another test execution since you ran them, so we don't know if these results are still valid anymore. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of the, the unit testing stuff. Uh, two last super quick things about unit testing. One of the interesting things is sometimes I don't wanna run all the tests in my solution. Sometimes I wanna run part of them. Uh, that can be a pain to kind of track and manage. You know, the new Test Explorer window lets you define how you group things. And so that can, be ba can make it easier if you want to switch up your groupings, but it's still not necessarily what you want. And so let's take these integration tests, these slow ones, and we'll right click on them, and we'll say let's add them to a new playlist. And a new playlist basically gives me another copy of the Test Explorer window, uh, but that is scoped to just that set of tests. And I can save that into a file Let's call these slow tests. Um, and so back here in Test Explorer, uh, you know, if I close this, this is now an artifact that travels with my solution. And so I can come over here and click Open Playlist and I can get back. So I can configure different subsets of tests to run and store them as playlist files and get back to them. And lastly, uh, we do the same thing for live unit testing. So live unit testing is sort of an implicit playlist. Uh, so I can come over here and click start and use live unit testing and it has its own window so you can see kind of the exact state of what's going on with live unit testing. Um, see all of the tests across the whole solution instead of having to use the margin. So here we're waiting to run uh, with live unit testing. 
And there we've run it. Uh, I can similarly like just make a change. Um, and uh, live unit testing will rerun just those failed or just those changed set of tests, and it will immediately update without me even saving or invoking uh, a, a, um, a test run. It'll let me know what what tests have failed. It'll let me know the code coverage. So this says this is actually covered by a test that fails. Um, other tests are covered by tests that pass. Right. So this is these lines are covered by tests that pass. Um, and so live unit testing is kind of another way that you can get that kind of ambient sense of what's going on in your code. Is this code covered? Is it covered by passing tests? Is it covered by failing tests? Let my machine do a bunch of work in the background to just kind of manage all those tests for me and tell me how the code I'm writing is without me having to do it myself. All right, I am at 2.40, uh, so I will not show any more slides in this session. I will end it here. Um, I'll stick around for any questions that people might have. But thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of what Visual Studio 2019 can do.